Hello and welcome to Backlisted, the podcast that gives new life to old books. Uh, on behalf of Aberdeen Performing Arts and the Festival Partners, welcome to Granite Noir. We are delighted you've joined us for this event, part of the digital staging of Aberdeen's International Crime Writing Festival. Today, you find us in the provincial England of the late 1940s. It's the open day at a physical training college for young women, a warm midsummer afternoon, we're watching a demonstration of gymnastics, paying particular attention to the girls' faces, the length of their noses, the set of their mouths, <laughs> and the eyebrows in particular. I'm John Mitchinson, the publisher of Unbound, the platform where readers crowdfund the books they really want to read. And I'm Andy Miller, author of The Year of Reading Dangerously. And today we are joined by a very special guest, none other than the queen of crime herself <laughs> to talk about another queen of crime herself, Val McDermott. Hey! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Val needs no introduction, but she's going to get one anyway. <laughs> she has sold over 17 million books. She is translated into more than 40 languages and had her work made into a string of hit TV series. She's won. Take a deep breath the CWA Gold Dagger, the CWA Cartier Diamond Dagger, the Grand Prix des Romains d'Aventure, the Lambda Literary Foundation Pioneer Award, the Stonewall Writer of the Year, the LA Times Book of the Year Award, and uniquely has been shortlisted in four different categories in the Mystery Writers of America Edgar Awards. And if that ain't a queen, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what is. Incredible. In 2016, she received the Outstanding Contribution to Crime Fiction Award at the Theakston's Old Peculiar Harrogate Crime Festival. And in 2017, she was elected a fellow of both the Royal Society of Literature and the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Her best-known crime novels are The Wire and the Blood series, featuring clinical psychologist Dr Tony Hill and DCI Carol Jordan. But Val has also created three other series, including one featuring cold case detective Karen Pirry. Her latest Karen Pirry novel, which I, I happen to have displayed behind me here <laughs> in hardback, <laughs> it's Still true. Life, true is listeners. now available to buy in paperback. Is that correct, Val? I believe it is. It's correct, just out a couple of weeks ago. Uh, oh. Straight into the charts at number three and gone up this week to number two. Not that I'm oh, interested in anything. A queen. Incredible. A queen, Incredible. gentlemen. A queen. <laughs> uh, and there's a new hardback novel coming in August. Yes. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And a new series. Yes, it's. A, 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 I'm planning a quintet of novels uh, set over four and a bit decades of 10-year intervals. So starting with 1979, which was a great year to write about. Wow. Winter of Discontent. Yeah. Lizards, yeah, yeah, Shawadi Wadi at the top of the charts. Brilliant, mu <laughs> brilliant music, perhaps the greatest year ever for music. Um, I, I feel I feel insolent for having asked you if you've been reading anything because you've <laughs> clearly been super productive. Um, and we also we do we should also say that um, uh, 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 that you also had a, a radio series in 2017 called Resistance. Mm -hmm. which is appearing as a graphic novel, isn't it, in May this year? That's Incredible. right, yeah. Now, I can remember, I haven't heard Resistance, but I, my wife says to tell you that <laughs> throughout the last year, she has thought of little except Resistance because she heard it when it went out. And I can remember her saying to me, I've just listened to this Val McDermott thing. It was absolutely brilliant. Yeah. It was all about the practicalities, Val. <laughs> that's what she, said. <laughs> that's what she yeah. said. It was how you deal with certain issues. So does it, did it feel weird? Has it felt weird over the last year knowing you've, you, you wrote that thing, which has been probably quite topical? It, it has felt very strange. Um, it was a, a, it's a three-part radio drama uh, about a pandemic a much a much worse pandemic than COVID. Uh, it's a bacterial pandemic, and of course the drugs don't work anymore because we've 
we've run out of antibiotic effectiveness. And so uh, it started at a starts at a music festival in Northumberland and and uh, rips through the population uh, until there's really only about two million people left in the entire world. And I didn't think this was a very cheerful <laughs> thing to be talking about too much in, in, in the present climate. But we we had just decided to turn it into a graphic novel. Well, not just it was, it was actually almost finished. Uh, the production of uh, turning it into a graphic novel when we all went into lockdown uh, and it was ready for the summer last year. And, but I, I was very un, uneasy about putting it out in the yeah. summer last year because at that point, none of us had any idea where this was yeah. going. There didn't appear to be much in the way of, of light at the end of the tunnel. And I didn't want to upset people or frighten people any more than they were already upset mm. and frightened. So we've held it back. Uh, and I think now that we can all have, a, I think, a better grasp of how this is going, uh, it's coming out in May, uh, so if you and want to, and who's, you want the to who, who's the artist you've worked with on that? The artist is a, is a young American artist called Catherine Briggs. She's done short nice. comic books before. This is her first full length graphic novel, and she was in, working in Dundee at the time that uh, we we were looking for an artist. And uh, she's now back in America because, of course, the usual thing of visa ran out. Uh, right. But she's done a fantastic job. Lots of uh, she's drawn in lots of different styles of, of drawing. I mean, yeah. I, I drawing. What do I know about drawing? I can't draw a straight line. <laughs> but, uh, I, I think she's done an amazing job, and I hope that people will will read it and uh, take heart from it that things could be so much worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's coming out in May. So that's that's resistance. That's coming out in May. Yeah. And we've got three other Val McDermott fun <laughs> facts. <laughs> <laughs> So you've had an online video series called <laughs> Cook it, "Cooking the Books," yes. like people like people do. What 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 is yeah. that? Please tell um, us what that is. Cooking the books is uh, recipes from the fiction kitchen. Uh, <laughs> okay. So I, I I was at the start of the lockdown. I was doing a lot of events online, a lot of virtual events, and and I was a bit worried that I, I kept doing the same thing because you know writers only have essentially one shtick. You know, we can't make up a whole new backstory. How I came to write is how I came to write. So I thought I need to do something a wee bit more uh, offbeat, I suppose, that will entertain my readers and, and make them feel uh, engaged and connected without having to listen to me tell them about go to the public library for the 12 billion time. <laughs> so uh, a lot of people ask me about the, the, the things that characters eat in the books, recipes in the books or vague recipes in the books. And so we thought it'd be quite fun to start doing a sort of cookery videos mm. of, of cooking some of the things in the books and that's how it started and uh, it became a thing we did we did eight initially and then we've done three specials since then uh and there will probably be more <laughs> i think you've done your bit to keep morale up <laughs> over the last year um and also uh, this uh, second fun fact val is a lifelong supporter of wraith rovers football club mm. when was the last time you went to a football match Tail end of last season, yeah. Um, no, was it? Was it even tail end of last season? Was it? No, yeah, it was last January, February. Um, it's it's hard not being able to go to the football, um, but especially since we're having such a great season. I mean, we've had some exceptional results. Yeah, yeah. We beat Dundee three 0 We beat Morton five 0 We beat Hearts. <laughs> I mean, it's it's we're second place in the in the division, which is quite remarkable. And we only just moved up to the championship and here we are in second place. It's, it's We should all be at Starks Park shouting on Saturday afternoons, but yeah, instead we're all in our living rooms shouting. It's not quite yeah, the same. It's a, it's a year of contrasts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and finally, of course, Val is the lead singer of the band <laughs> Fun Loving Crime Writers uh, with our friend Mark Billingham. Yes. Uh, and, uh, I, I, and I'm always fascinated to know what the chemistry in that group is like. Is it really volatile? Is it like a is it like a a, a, a Kinks or a Who, or or is it not like that? <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint you. It's really not like that at all. Oh, okay. Crime, <laughs> crime writers tend to be quite convivial and 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 pally, yeah. and we're, we're we're just like we're a bunch bunch of mates going out and having fun. I think I think one of the key elements to our, our success and our friendship is that we're not doing original material. Yeah, We're doing covers. cover versions of songs about about murder, basically, um, and crime <laughs> generally. But nobody's coming in saying, "I've written this great song," and everybody else go, "Well, that's, that's crap." <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, 
<laughs> so there are yeah. no musical differences. <laughs> and presumably you're looking for, well, again, another thing we can't do at the moment, play music. But um, yeah, presumably you'll be, you played Glastonbury, didn't you? That's, yeah. That's the, we did. That's we played Glastonbury. I mean, how, how, how nuts is that? You know, a bunch of middle-aged crime writers playing glass. <laughs> really? It. It's, really, it's 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 not. It would. It's so it's absurd. It wouldn't even have made our bucket list two years before that. Yeah. Well, Steve, isn't Stephen King in a in a famous uh, kind of? Band? Yes, he's in the Rock Bottom Remainers. The Rock Bottom Remainers. That's what with thought, with yeah. Matt Groening. Is Matt Groening in the Rock Bottom yeah. Remainers? Someone will tell us. They're not as good uh, as us. No, I no. think that that's a given. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, John. Right. Uh, well, we should talk about the book that um, the, the book that uh, that Val has chosen for us to discuss today is a, as we've already said, is a classic um, crime novel by a classic crime writer, Miss Pym Disposes, by Josephine Tay, first published by Peter Davis Limited in 1946, and described by the Saturday Review as leisurely, amusing, penetrating, with a thumping terminal surprise. Um, I don't know whether so we'll get let's, to it. Let's hear. A, for some scene setting, for those of you who may not have read this novel, uh, Miss Pym Disposes by Josephine Tay. Here is some audio to help you place it. That's right. It's science fiction. Um, <laughs> uh, um, no, it's not. Um, I'm going to read the blurb straight away so everybody right. knows when, when and where it's set. And then, Val, I'm going to ask you about um, to tell us a bit about the golden age crime novels of which this is one. So, Miss Pym Disposes by Josephine Tay. Uh, the blurb on the back of the book says, Lay's Physical Training College was famous for its excellent discipline and Miss Lucy Pym was pleased and flattered to be invited to give a psychology lecture there. But she had to admit that the health and vibrant beauty of the students made her feel just a little inadequate. Then there was a nasty accident and suddenly Miss Pym was forced to apply her agile intellect to the unpleasant fact that among all those impressively healthy bodies, someone had a very sick mind. Ding, ding, ding. Um, Val, it's a, it's a, Josephine Tay is synonymous with the goal, correctly or incorrectly, with the golden age of crime writing. What do we mean by the golden age of crime writing? Well, when people talk about the golden age, they generally mean that sort of period between the wars when the crime novel really emerged as, as one of the most popular forms of, of fiction. And they talk about the, the, the four queens of crime, so Agatha Christie, Dorothy Sayers, Marjorie Allingham, Niall Marsh. There were, of course, uh, men writing as well, very successfully, people like Michael Innes. Uh, but it's the, it's the queens of crime who, who stand out. Essentially, this is the, the murder at the vicarage kind of thing, the body in the library yeah. uh, I suppose you could, you could call it a random murder bolted onto a random English village uh, <laughs> solved by a spinster or a Belgian detective with strange mm. moustaches. Mm. There were certain conventions. They had a whole set of rules from the detection club, which, which included marvellous things like no more than one secret room or hidden passage per book. <laughs> That's right. no, no sets of twins. Isn't that That's one right. of them? And no Chinaman. <laughs> well, <laughs> it is. Yes, who, who knows why? But uh, the, the, these, these books were immensely popular and they, they did emerge around the same time as the crossword puzzle emerged. And yeah. there were certain elements that, uh, yeah. of similarity that there was uh, a certain structure to these books. At the end, of course, the criminal was always unmasked and uh, either by the police or handed over to the police to go and, and face their fate at the gallows. Uh, however, uh, there were other writers who took the ideas of the detective novel and, and morphed them slightly. And I think Josephine Tay is preeminent among them. Yeah. And I tend to see Tay not as, a, as the epitome of golden age crime fiction, mm. but yeah. as a kind of bridge 
between the golden age and the more modern period. She's concerned with issues of identity, of gender, of sexuality, uh, not in any overt and vulgar way, um, but all of those things are the kind of undercurrent of the, of the figure disappearing behind the curtain. And she's also fascinated by, by psychology, by why people yeah. do the things they do. And I think she's, she's the, 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 the foremother, if you like, of, of Patricia Highsmith and Ruth Rendell when it comes yes. to yes. that yeah, sort yeah. of... Yes, definitely. Sort of the one. bridge between... Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I'd never read Miss Pym Disposes before, and one of the things... Well, we haven't. We should have discussed this before we started. We're going to do it now in front of you all. We can't give away the ending. No. No, we can't. And we can't give away the ending of many of these books that we might talk about. We can't but even give away the. We can't even give away the ending that you think is the ending until you get to the ending. Indeed, you know what indeed. I mean? it's, it's got classic double ending. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, or more, or more. Ooh. But I think one of the things that, that, that we can say without giving too much away is that the murder doesn't happen until yeah. about... Chapter 16. It's, 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 it's a long way, it's 100 and page 170 or something. There's, like nothing, there's nothing to suggest this is a mystery or crime novel yeah. until two-thirds of the way through the book, Yeah, um, which is, I mean, pretty audacious. I mean, considering it's, it's 1946, so yes, it is maybe getting a bit later, and well, that's a pretty audacious way to write a crime novel. Yeah. I... Um, I, I I started reading really, you know, page fifty. I was thinking, well, the pace here is quite—that's quite interesting. Yeah, no, no, no sign of a murder. Page one hundred, <laughs> yeah. still no violence, no menace. Page one hundred and fifty. Hmm, this is interesting. It, there's like it's forty pages to go, isn't there? Before, yeah. yeah. And that Val, I found totally fascinating. fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it made me think, well, what is what is this novel of really about? What is the? Where am I meant to be looking? There is no body for me to look at. So what else am I meant to be looking at? I think, I mean, I think what, what she wants us to look at is, is why people do the things they do, yeah. but also the ethical decisions that people make, why people make those choices. Uh, and, and that takes us through right to the end. Yeah. Uh, the morality of, of what lies behind our actions. This was, this was the very first Josephine Tay novel I ever encountered. I hadn't heard about Josephine Tay. Um, I, I was, at the time, I was devouring uh, as much crime fiction as I could get my hands on, uh, almost all of it from second-hand bookshops. When I was at Oxford, there was a, a wonderful second-hand bookshop at the bottom of the Cowley Road, Jeremy's 10p Bookshop. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, <that's>... and... <laughs> It really called that. Was that it really no, called Jeremy's, Jeremy's 10p? 10p How's oh, this the Ron Seal test? Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. And um, you, 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 you bought a book for 10p. If you didn't like it, you took it back. You got 5p back. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was the foundation. Booksellers, they know nothing. <laughs> that was the foundation of my, my crime fiction library. So at that point in my life, um, I, I was you know haunting secondhand bookshops and charity shops. And essentially, I would I would buy anything that that looked like a decent crime novel, and and so I, and I saw this book, Miss uh, wow. Pym disposes. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Ooh, um, that's a good jacket. Yeah, I, and I, I inside it says that I I, I bought it in uh, April nineteen seventy six, uh, and I paid fifteen p for it. <laughs> good lord! <laughs> yeah, you, you Which, paid a premium. <laughs> yeah. And I, I read it. It says on, on my, my blurb says, accessory to murder. To Lucy Pym, author of a bestseller on psychology, the atmosphere at the college where she is lecturing is heavy with tension. Beneath the so normal surface run sinister undercurrents of rivalry and jealousy. Then comes tragedy. An accident or murder? Respectable, law-abiding Miss Pym discovers some vital evidence. But should she reveal it? <sighs> Yes, it's the, like you say, it's the moral dilemma, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's a the huge moral, moral dilemma. dilemma. Yeah. And without, again, without giving anything away, it's quite a shocking book, yes. morally. It I is. Mean, um, it is. Um, and it's, I think it, it's, it's built up beautifully. And the, yeah. the, the thing that, that draws you in from the beginning, I mean, right at the very beginning, Josephine Tay writes great opening paragraphs. <laughs> um, she, she draws you in. They're not, they're, not, they're not overly dramatic. They're not exciting particularly. But what she does is she paints a picture either of a person or a scene and it immediately connects to something we recognise. We feel immediately involved in the book. 
we, we, we're drawn in because we're in a world that is familiar and yet there's always a little bit more to take us on. There's a, there's a great opening section in um, The Singing Sands, which is uh, her final novel. It was, it was posthumous. And it, 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 it opens, I think, wonderfully, atmospherically. It's, it was six o'clock of a March morning and still dark. The long train came sidling through the scattered lights of the yard, clicking gently over the points into the glow of the signal cabin and out again, under the solitary emerald among the rubies on the signal bridge, on towards the empty grey waste of platform that waited under the arcs. Right away, it's the opening of a black and white movie. Yeah, lovely. You're there, you see it, you, you know where you are. And she situates us wonderfully, either with a person or with a place, and you want to read on. I mean, there's none of that sort of Miss Marple kind of uh, scene setting. I mean, she, this book, she starts with a, uh, somebody being woken violently by an alarm bell and trying to find a, slapping around trying to find a watch. The second chapter is even madder. The second chapter isn't. She was being beaten with canouts by two six-foot Cossacks because she persisted in using the old-fashioned safety pin when progress decreed a zip fastener, and the blood had begun to trickle down her back when she woke to fa the fact that the only thing that was being assaulted was her hearings. Another, another alarm bell and a dream interrupted. I mean, it's quite disorienting if you're expecting if you're expecting kind of uh, as you say village sort of cozy village well, life, and even in the cozy village life novels, they're not really like that. It's also yeah. an, a niche within a niche. I've got a very short list here of golden age or post golden age detective novels, which specifically, <laughs> in which specifically, educated women and criminality come into violent contact. So the <laughs> idea of all female <laughs> establishments being corrupted by some kind of accident or murder, and they would include Body Knight. Dorothy Gordy Knight. Sayers, Gordy yeah, Knight. Yeah, yeah. Any more? Um, it's, it is hard, this. Death on the Cherwell by Mavis Doriel Hay. Yeah, right. right. That's one of the British Library ones, isn't it? It is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, John C. Val knew it. <laughs> Crikey. I, I, I think there's a Patricia Wentworth, Miss Silver one, but I can't recall precisely which one, but it's, no doubt people will it's tell not, us. It's not the answer I have on the card. I could get. But I've yeah, got one more. Gladys Mitchell. Nice. Ah, yes. Ah, yes, yes Laurels yes. are poison, Laurel, 1942. Yeah, yeah. That was in the that was in the biography. That was that's yeah, in a Alice teacher that set at a teacher training college. Yeah. Um but that's but but of course but, uh, would you, you could probably as a post golden age one pull in uh, P. D. James Shroud for a Nightingale, uh -huh. uh, which is set in a, a nurses' training college. There you go. Then we go see if this Zoom. Will, that for a if, bonus point. Yeah, you do. Yes, you I think you do point. get a definite bonus point. If this Zoom were live, I would expect this to be lighting up now with yeah. <laughs> with suggestions yeah. of people. But you people say like. violent criminality, Andy. That's yes. There's none of that in in Miss Pym disposes. Well, there, well, there is some violence and there is criminality. I mean, there are there are there isn't a gang of criminals to yeah. give nothing away. But yeah. Um, yeah. I, I suppose what I, I suppose one of the things that I'm uh, interested in is none of the Josephine Tay novels that I've read in the last few weeks really cleave to that. Um, model of cozy crime at all they're, they're no. all it seems like what she does is she she takes that as her starting point and then she finds different ways to take it to bits so to love and be wise uh while set in a village with a number of suspects we again we can't talk about the ending of that one either can we val <laughs> absolutely not <laughs> there's, 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 there's very little we can say about that that isn't but, crucially but again it's a moral away. but it's a moral it's a moral dilemma rather yes. than a who done it there is an element of a of a who done it yeah. and, um, and the same with brat farrer yeah there's absolutely. a moral dilemma at the heart yeah, of that absolutely. and she starts she starts these moral dilemmas with quite small seeds Yes, and that's one of the things that I think is a common feature in in the books is they start with with uh, this apparently innocuous small stuff, and yeah. gradually it, that sort of spreads its tentacles out, and and people's 
lives are infected in ways that you wouldn't yeah. imagine at the start yes, of it that, that this could a, lead to. It's a great way of describing it. It's that sense that sense of, of criminality actually kind of emerging out of just small mistakes, small yeah. errors that people make rather at, than... Yeah, actions have consequences. Yeah, yeah. And she's sort of more interested in the consequences than the actions. Right. Yeah. That's the thing you're left yeah. as a reader to to mull over. Um, uh, yeah, and she, the other thing is that, uh, that um, she she's just she she really does understand uh, what makes people tick. There's a there's a point where Miss um, Pym she's she's supposed to be there for one night in this college. <laughs> yeah. She's sort of sucked into it, and and she finds herself being drawn to these 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 young women and and their life, and she's in, she becomes interested in them. She's written this popular book about psychology, and that she 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 makes that her excuse to herself for staying on. But actually, it's because she's fascinated by these these young women and their, their lives, and she actually at, there's a, a moment where. It, it, it's actually quite a sad little moment. She she's talking about how this is giving her all this wonderful human contact. And she says, except for Mrs. Montmorency from one of the suburbs of Manchester, who was her daily help, and her aunt Celia down in Walberswick, who sometimes had her for weekends, and the tradespeople, she never talked to anyone who wasn't somehow connected with the publishing or the academic worlds. And though all the ladies and gentlemen belonging to those two worlds were, of course, both intelligent and amusing. There was no denying that their interests were limited. You couldn't, for instance, talk to one and the same person about social security, hillbilly songs, and what won the 330. Yeah, they each brilliant. had their subject. Yes. And their subject, she had found to her cost, was only too likely to be royalties. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a great passage. But also the books, the novel is sort of about her, it struck me anyway, is about her identity. You know, she's put there. She is. What is she? She's a writer, but she considers herself to be a writer by accident. And she's in a girls' school, uh, a teacher, uh, sorry, a physical training college, where she feels she doesn't fit. She doesn't fit with the girls. She doesn't fit with her ex schoolmate, who's now the head teacher. And without giving away any of the endings of this book, her idea of herself is one of the things that the that the last few pages of the book really burrow into very deeply don't they yeah and i think yeah. that's it's, it's interesting that this is i, th I think of, of all tay's novels the the one that actually draws most specifically on her own life experience but she yes. did attend uh she, she trained as a pe teacher uh and after she trained she went and taught in various schools and ended up in a school in oban where she had an accident very similar to the one that uh happens in the book <laughs> Uh, and she drew on that experience. And clearly, uh, I, I imagine that many of, if any of the people that she was at college with had read this book, they'd probably have been quite cross because mm. the, the descriptions are, are are not always sparing of people. Well, I wanted and, to I wanted yeah. to ask you, Val, from a professional point of view as a writer, when you look at Miss Pym disposes, and we know that it was inspired by you know, a period in her life and a thing that happened during that. Was that the starting point of the book? Or or do you feel like she she wanted, had a moral issue she wanted to explore and that fit? Or doesn't it or can't we can't we break it up like that? Uh I think because of if you look at the the, the rest of Tay's work, it's clear that the, these kind of hard moral choices were, were what uh, inspired her. Uh, she's also been inspired by by real cases uh, that I think have appealed to her as as possibilities for fiction. So with Brat Farrer and the Franchise Affair, uh, they're both rooted in in real uh, cases, historic cases. And of course, the Daughter of Time deals with the, the historic, uh, what she feels the historic injustice done <laughs> to Richard, Richard the Third. <laughs> uh, so I suspect that she she had um, she was provoked to fiction by issues that she thought she'd like to explore and then found a way to tell those stories. Uh, and I, I also imagine that, you know, you get to a point that this was um, quite, a, quite a bit into her c career uh, and you, you sort of think, oh, God, I need a setting. I need to, I need to put this somewhere different and interesting. Uh, I mean, she, what, what do I know about? She was 50 when she wrote this, wasn't she? I mean, she, yeah. she, she, so, and, and well, she has this incredible purple patch yeah. as Josephine Tay. We're going to talk a bit about her biography in a minute, but but basically the novels for which she's most famous 
are written towards the end of her life, mm-hmm. one a year for five or six years. In fact, she's yeah. she's even more productive than that, isn't she? Because she's also writing plays. And um, um, <clears throat> it's it's interesting. Used also that that status thing about that there were some issues within Penguin about whether or not she should be included in the Green Penguin crime series. You know, so it was it wasn't as it wasn't as though this wasn't an issue at the time. It's not a, a, a thing. I mean, she, it's they were. Odd, I think they were odd and powerful books when they were published. Um, Nikki, she could was, we? She, sorry, could we? Sorry, Nick, could we prepare to listen to clip number three? And I'll just uh, say something about it. So. Um, Elizabeth Mackintosh, uh, her real name, not her playwright name, which was Gordon Daviot, also it's quite confusing this, also used for 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 some of her novels, or Josephine Tay, her, her the name she she used for many of her novels, um, was born in Inverness in 1896. And I wanted to give you I watched, I looked for a few things that I thought would give us a taste of Inverness in the early years of the 20th century. Unfortunately. In 1935, following sightings of the Loch Ness Monster, Pathé Newsreels sent a camera team <laughs> to, to Inverness where they offered uh, people round Britain a, a two-minute tour of the city. And we're just going to hear a clip from that now. Lying on both sides of the River Ness, not far from the now-famous Loch of that name, is Inverness, often known as the capital of the Highlands. This title is given to the town because of its situation, its fine buildings, and because of the beauty of its environment. Many students of our mother tongue consider that the finest English is spoken here. Rather strange at first thought, but not difficult when the town's thousand years of history is considered. It is easy to imagine how hardy those men of the north became in the fastness of the highlands. With such a history which we can read, and with such grand scenery which we can see, it is no wonder that the Highlander is still so proud and so famous throughout the world. <laughs> well, if that patronising gits, <laughs> yes, I thought I thought you'd enjoy that. <laughs> yeah, look at them, look at those, look I, at them working. I have to say, I have proud to say, Highlanders, proud <laughs> Highlanders. I have to say, on a personal note, that it was in Inverness in 1982 that I first became familiar with the concept of debauchery. Oh yeah, <laughs> famous per- t- famous for it. Not per- not personally, but we were we were on holiday, and um, it was August, and it was a Saturday afternoon in August. It was the Inverness Carnival, and my 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 dad um, had been evacuated to Scotland in the war, and and lived in that part of the world for a, for several years, and loved and loved it. But I can remember him laughing out loud at the sheer. Um, um, drunken insanity of the average Saturday afternoon at the at the Inverness <laughs> Carnival. It was absolutely fantastic. I can still remember it to this day. Uh, Val, what is, is, just... is Josephine Tay seen as a Scottish writer? Yeah, well, we claim her as a Scottish writer because she was from Inverness and she, she lived there for a long time. And, and she, you know, sets some of her work in Scotland. Uh, Singing Sands is, is set mostly in Scotland. Um, I, I'm always slightly taken aback when I, I think that of her, her date of birth. She was an exact contemporary of my granny. And my granny would have had no interest whatsoever in the things that Josephine Tay writes about in her books. Uh, uh, identity, gender, sexuality, uh, moral dilemmas. <laughs> None of that would, have, would yeah. have even crossed my granny's mind. Uh, so she, she's, a, she's, a, she's an absolute oddity and she's a real one-off. Um, she, she was teaching in, in schools uh, after she trained, and then her mother died, and she had to go back to Inverness because she was the unmarried daughter, and somebody had to cook her dad's tea uh, and take care of the house and do the things that you needed a woman's touch for. Uh, so she went back to Inverness, uh, and that's when she really started uh, writing her, her crime novels later on. Uh, she went back to Inverness when she was 30, uh, so still a young woman. But she would go down to London because she had this success, huge success with her play, Richard of Bordeaux, That's right. uh, which was a global success, went to Broadway. It's the play that launched John Gielgud's mm. career. Uh, and 
she would get on the train in Inverness. She'd get on the sleeper in Inverness. I, lo- I love this this mental image. She'd yeah. get on the sleeper yeah. in Inverness. You can imagine her tweed skirt, cardigan, yeah. pearls, um, sensible shoes. And then she'd get off the train at Euston in the morning and she'd go to her furriers <laughs> and collect her basically her London wardrobe and yeah. then check into her London club. Yeah. And it's a completely schizophrenic. She'd get on the train as Beth McIntosh and get off the train as Gordon Daviot or Josephine Tay, depending on who you were talking to. <laughs> uh, and the, the, none of the twain should meet. Her, none of She had a, 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 a circle of friends in London who were all in, connected to the theatre or connected to racing. She didn't yeah. hang out with other writers at all. She, she bucks the crime writers are convivial trend completely. <laughs> uh, she was never elected to the detection club, presumably because she was not deemed to be sufficiently clubbable, which is one of the criteria for being elected to the detection club. Uh, and none of her London friends ever visited her in Inverness. It's completely compartmentalized life. Uh, so there was the Inverness, where you know she was this douce Invernessian mm, mm. with with a nice house and lovely garden. People used to come and go past and comment on how lovely her garden was. Uh, and then there's this other secret life uh, on the night sleeper, collecting her furs and 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 being the lady author with all yes. her theatrical friends, who were almost exclusively, it has to be said, either gay men or lesbians. There's some very interesting, amazing, amazing very interesting things in Jennifer Morag Hendonson's biography of Josephine Tay. Um, I asked you whether she was considered a Scottish writer. That she seems to have had an ambivalent relationship with her hometown, certainly. And you, Jennifer suggests that the hometown had a slightly ambivalent relationship with her. I mean, they, they, <laughs> she, you were saying to us earlier, she was sort of. She's a real Anglophile, isn't she? She sort she, of she left all her estate to the National Trust in England, yes. which is a strange thing to do if you're, you know, Scottish. I yes, know. and she was very much a lone wolf as well. I mean, people yeah. that she was at school with talk about how she never really made friends. She always kept her distance. Uh, but yes, yeah, she she's, it's clear from the books that she loved the English countryside, and she loved the the whole racing community in, in mm. England. She loved to go to the races, to go to Newmarket or, or to go to Aintree. These were the highlights of her year. Um, and she had her friend, you know, she did have these strong connections of friendship with people in England. She had, um, she also writes though very, very movingly and, and, and with great affection about the Scottish landscape as well, both in the Singing Sands uh, and there's a little section towards the end of To Love and Be Wise where she she's talking to a painter about uh, paintings of, of the mountains of Sutherland and, and Skye. Uh, but I, I, I'm not sure what the disconnect was, but also in The Singing Sands, there's a character who is a, a, a Scottish nationalist, and she absolutely lacerates this character, and he's horrible. He's a <laughs> deeply unpleasant. And I would say that at this point in history, the SNP was a pretty deeply unpleasant right-wing party, uh, Tartan Tories, as they're, they're known in, in, in memory. Uh, but uh, something clearly was problematic for her. Maybe it was simply that she got dragged back from yeah. this life that she was really beginning mm. to enjoy, uh, teaching and, and, and making her own way in the world and, and starting off her career as a writer and then had to go back and, and, and do the groceries in Inverness. And that's definitely there in the in the book, isn't it? The Mary Innes character in the book is somebody who doesn't want to go back and live yeah. in a prov- in a provincial town, yeah. um, and, and 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 rebels against it. That school has opened her horizons. Yeah. One of the reasons why uh, Josephine Tay was a very popular um, novelist for film, TV, and radio uh, adaptations in the post-war period, certainly in the fifties and the sixties, and that's partly because of Gordon Davies' success with Richard of Bordeaux. But actually, it's, it's also because having left her copyrights to the National Trust, as Jennifer Maura Henderson points out in her biography, it, it was very easy to get hold of the rights to adapt <laughs> um, Josephine Tay. So she has this second life as uh, material for different uh, filmmakers and TV makers and, and um, radio producers to make what they will of her work. Mm. And... For instance, um, there was a very successful film of the franchise affair made in 1950, 
um, which is on Talking Pictures TV fairly regularly. Uh, yeah. It's terrific. Um, in the in the Hitchcock a- made an early yeah. film for the adaptation mm-hmm. of Shilling for Candles, didn't he? Which- Young and innocent. Yeah. Young and he's, innocent. He's, he's, yeah. he's shoot. He's trying to get some of that thirty nine steps magic, but it doesn't quite no. it doesn't quite come off. It's full of lovely things that film. Yeah. Um, and um, in the eighties, the last couple of serials that Terence Dix made as part of, for the classic serial on BBC TV were Brat Farrer and um, the Franchise Affair. But also in the early sixties, Hammer films. Made it have, and now I don't think either of you have seen this. <laughs> oh, I have been spared that delight. Well, we're going to hear the, we're going to hear the trailer, and Ooh. you'll hear how sensitive it is to the material. Um, it's based it's on Brat adap- Farrow, right? It's an adaptation of Brat Farrow, but they've changed the title to Paranoiac. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the first word that springs to mind. <laughs> Brilliant. The dictionary says Paranoiac one who suffers from delusions of grandeur, persecution, mental disease, mental disease. (laughs) Eleanor Ashby, whose beautiful young life is darkened by a sinister shadow. Her sister is sick. Sick? Well, she's... She's very upset. Auntie, dear, my sister's insane. Simon Ashby, whose twisted, greedy mind was obsessed by an inheritance of half a million pounds. For eight years, they presumed that Anthony Ashby was dead. Now, his unexpected return engulfs the Ashby family in a wave of terror. Don't come near me! Glorious. I Glorious. don't remember that scene. <laughs> <laughs> I will say it does. It, it, Have you seen the, best, the film? Yeah, yeah. The oh, best thing about right. I watched it this week because I knew we were doing this. It's got Ollie Reed in it. It's got early, a beautiful. Playing Stephen Ashby. That, that's uh, yeah, Simon Ashby. Simon beautiful. Ashby, sorry. Yeah. Ollie Reed at his most early 60s, Lucian Beautiful. Oh. So it's, watch, it's worth it for that. Um, but. <laughs> But it does look like they made the film based on whatever sets they happen to have lying around. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's not great. But the, but the, the, the book of Brat Farrow, I meant to say to you, Val, I mean, that, that book alone seems to break most of those yes. crime club Ooh. rules, yes. doesn't yes. it? And it's, yes. got, it's got twins and it relies on coincidence, pr- preposterous coincidence. And yet again, it's not really about... The events. It's about the psychological. The Brat Farrer yeah. himself. You, the first half of the book, he's almost got a kind of proto entertaining Mister Sloan yeah, yeah. style yeah. blankness to him, or a Ripley. You don't know what he's going to be. Is he going to be yeah. Ripley? Yeah, he could. But and, and I think that that um, I mean, what what we see there, but what draws us into the book is the way that she writes about characters. She she had tremendously um, trying to skill at bringing people to life on the page. And she was she was obsessed with um, an observation. She won, she she was always yeah. studying people. And there's a passage she in, in a letter she wrote to Caroline Ramsden, who was a very close friend. Um, I used to go. She used to go racing with, and used to go and stay with, and go on holidays with. Uh, and she said in this letter, "Oh, for one of those spy cameras that one wears as a type in." <laughs> <laughs> when I was in town this last time, I thought that apart from a well-fitting new suit, there was nothing in the world that I wanted. And then I thought that, yes, there was. I wanted a camera that looked like a handbag or a compact or something so that one could photograph a person standing two feet away and be looking in another direction altogether while one was doing it. This is a permanent need with me. I'm always seeing faces that I want to keep. Yes. Hmm. Faces that I want to keep. Now, faces. Let's talk yeah, a bit no, about it's faces. It's so important yeah. in this book, right? Yeah. And it's, that's a really uh, big thing in, in Miss Pym Disposes. And uh, uh, throughout uh, her books as well, <coughs> excuse me, there is a faint obsession with eyebrows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she really, really and means it. The, the whole of, the, whole of um, the Singing Sands uh, starts off because 
her, her, her detective, Inspector Grant, sees a dead man on the, the London sleeper who has tumbled hair and extraordinary eyebrows. And, mm. and this, this becomes um, a fixation with him. I've got a, a little section here. You were talking about her eye and faces and how she, her eye for detail. Um, there's a scene in Miss Pym Disposes set in a tea shop, which I just want to read you uh, a, a, a brief bit. Um, the tea shop is called The Teapot. It had all the properties stigmatised by the literary frequenters of yeah. village inns. <laughs> I love it. The Indian tree pattern china, the dark oak tables, the linen curtains in a Jacobean design. The herbaceous bouquets in unglazed brown jugs. Yes, even the arts and crafts in the window. But to Lucy, who in the Allen period, that's her, her former fiancé, I believe, had had her share of undusted snugs. <laughs> it was quite frankly charming. There was a rich scent of spiced cakes straight from the oven. There was, as well as the long window on the street, a further window that gave on a garden bright with colour. There was peace and coolness and welcome. And into this tea shop comes a couple. And in the light, um, Val, of what you were, you were just saying about <laughs> eyebrows, I thought it was worth um, sharing this as well, uh, her eye for detail. The couple moved about looking at things quietly, unselfconsciously, and then took the table at the other window. Lucy was relieved to see that the man was the mate she would have chosen for such a woman. A little saturnine, perhaps, more self-absorbed than the woman, but quite admirable. He reminded her of someone, but she could not think of whom. Someone whom she admired. The eyebrows, it was. <laughs> Dark level brush marks low over the eyes. His suit was very old, she noticed, well pressed and kept, but with that much cleaned air that overtakes a garment in its old age. The woman's suit, a tweed, was frankly shabby, and her stockings were darned very neatly darned at the heels. Her hands, too, looked as if they were accustomed to household tasks, and her fine grey hair was washed at home <laughs> and unwaved. What had she got to look so happy about this woman, who struggled with straightened means? Was it just being on holiday with a husband she loved? Was it that that gave her grey, luminous eyes an almost childlike happiness? I mean, that's, that's, that's writing of the highest order in terms of sketching out detail as she finds it, whether it's the tea yeah. shop or the characters involved. And she does that so often with, uh, and, and with characters that are just passing through the pages. They're not, they're not major figures in the, in the plot or whatever. But that couple, we later discover, are, are the parents of, of one of the, the students. And that student is... is I'm just going to do a little bit of description here, which again plugs into this thing of, of, of writing beautifully and, and giving, a, a creating an immediate image in your head that you know exactly what she's talking about. Who's the girl who fluffed the balance exercise? Was she not going to get away from Innes for two minutes altogether? Her name is Mary Innes. Why? What a wonderful face. Pure Borgia. Oh no, Lucy said sharply. <laughs> I've been wondering all afternoon what she reminded me of. I think it's a portrait of a young man by Giorgione, but which of his young man I wouldn't know. I should love to see them again. Anyhow, it's a wonderful face, so delicate and so strong, so good and so bad, quite fantastically beautiful. I can't imagine what anything so dramatic is doing at a girls' physical training college in the 20th century. Yeah. It's very good. Yeah. I mean, but, but also... <laughs> I was very surprised with Miss Pym Disposes how many characters there are. Mm. Yes. Do you know what I mean? I mean, if you were being ruthless, you would have half that dramatic, the, dramatic the, persona. Yeah, the staff room in particular is sort of, you know, lots and lots of characters and minor characters. All kind what, of what's going on there, Val? Why does she, what does she gain from doing that? She gains coming at everything from lots of different directions. So you never get to settle yeah. entirely on what you think of any one character because you're seeing them through several pairs of eyes. You're seeing them through, if it's one of the girls, you're seeing them through her friends, through her other contemporaries, through members of the staff. So you get these multifaceted sense of people, which wrong foots you as a reader. You're not quite sure what to think. 
you think you, you you make a decision about a character and then you see them through someone else's eyes and that you may have to go wait a minute uh, why am I making that decision isn't isn't this a better assessment and so that's what it does give you she's very good at differentiating between the characters I don't think it's at all confusing uh, which is is astonishing given that there are so many of them you know, it's, it, it's, it's sort of no misdirect- editor, would, editor would, would would tell you to cut them back. No, it's a kind of misdirection, isn't it? She, she, she. You, you. I, I found like you, Andy, going through the book, trying to think who, <laughs> who's, who's going to. I mean, you kind who's of going to do what to whom? Yeah, yeah. Is, yeah. Is, is is the issue. But yeah. she's brilliant at misdirection. You spend time with all sorts of different people through the course of the book. But there's yeah. a there's a there's an amazing passage I think at the end of the book, which feels to me more like Josephine Tay or. Um, uh, talking when you know I'm not giving anything away, but she is uh, Miss Pym is is d- refers to herself as a feeble waverer, and and wishes that the deity the deity had found another instrument. That's the idea of who, you know God disposes, uh, and obviously connects to the title. She'd always hated responsibility, so she says, however rabbity and inadequate she was by nature, there was always her other half, the Letitia half which stood watching her with critical eyes. She could never get away from that other half of herself. It sent her into fights with her knees knocking. It had made her speak when she wanted to hold her tongue. It had kept her from lying down when she was too tired to stand up. It would keep her from washing her hands now. Uh, Just going back to what you were saying, Val, about about, um, uh, Tay herself and this incredibly partitioned character, it felt to me that there's definitely she's definitely projecting something of herself into into the character of Miss Pym there. Yeah, I think you're probably right. Um, and but like all good writers, her character, her own personality is fragmented among yes. the different characters in the books. <laughs> um, uh, I, 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 her detective, uh, Inspector Alan Grant, is a, is a very atypical policeman. He's a man of, of sensitivity and intelligence. Yes. He's somewhere a, 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 a sort of marriage of. Albert Campion and, and Roderick Allen, mm. um, but mm. with, uh, I think, a much more appealing personality. Yeah, uh, and part of that, so that's clearly sort of part of, of herself. Then his, his very dear friend, who in anybody else's hands would have become the, the love interest or at the very least the unresolved sexual tension, Marta Hallard, yeah, the actor. Yeah. But he allows Grant and, and Marta to be the best of friends. Yeah, uh, and and there, there's there's moments where you know where Grant says you know if he if he was remotely uh, the marrying type then Marta would make someone a very good wife but it wasn't him, uh, and I think those sort of balancing acts between the different characters are the balancing acts that Josephine Tay Elizabeth McIntosh Gordon Daviot whatever we're going to call her mm. was doing herself. Yeah, uh, you were saying earlier that she was. Um... She, she, she had. She would get off the train in London and pick up her furs and and <laughs> hang out with her theatrical pals. Um, she's very one of the things I, as a co-host of this podcast, thoroughly enjoyed reading these books was how waspish she is about writers. Yeah, <laughs> and part, um, she hates yeah, writers, right? She really she, uh, she, yeah. she thinks they're all ridiculous and and publishing as well. She's very funny on the topic oh, there's, of there's books and publishing. There's yeah. a brilliant passage about about uh, you know because the, the, obviously the conceit of this book is that Lucy Pym has written this unexpected book bestseller which is called the book capitalized all the way through it so uh, and it's a book of psychology popular psychology so uh, the, towards the beginning of the novel now in normal times a publisher would have run for brandy at the mere suggestion of publishing a book on psychology. But the previous year, the British public had shaken the publishing world by tiring suddenly of fiction and developing an interest in abstruse subjects, such as the distance of Sirius from the earth and the inward meaning of primitive dancers in Betuana land. <laughs> Publishers were falling over themselves, therefore, in their effort to supply this strange new thirst for knowledge, and Miss Pym found herself welcomed with open arms. That is to say, she was taken to lunch by the senior par- partner and given an agreement to sign. This alone was a piece of luck, but Providence so ordained it that not only had the British public tired of fiction, but the intellectuals had tired of Freud and company. They were longing from for some new thing, and Lucy proved to be it. So Lucy woke one morning to find herself not only famous but a bestseller. 
She was so shocked that she went out and had three cups of black coffee and sat in the park looking straight in front of her for the rest of the morning. <laughs> uh, she loves her coffee. Yeah. yeah. But, 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 but bright, writers, she, she's, yeah, as she I said, I, I've, we, we haven't got time to, to share it. There's a brilliant pen portrait of, with dripping with uh, <laughs> disdain for, for, what's he called? Silas um, Weekly. Silas, Silas, Silas Weekly. Weekly. Which is clearly, <laughs> clearly D.H. Lawrence, yeah, Lawrence, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Who, who, he, he, she, she thinks that Silas, everything is downward in his books. Everyone is down and depressed. That's she, right. She thinks that he, he would like to imagine a kind of <laughs> manure that steamed downwards. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Inspector Grant b- bursts in on him at work in To Love and Be Wise. And there's a brilliantly waspish thing where he, he, he reports weekly turning around going, who on earth is breaking in? Don't you see I'm hard at work? And Grant notes that the ink on the paper is so dry that he hadn't written a word all morning. <laughs> you know, yeah. that he, that he's, he's, a, he's a, a, a fraud, I think, is the feeling that that, yeah. that Tay has. She's got. She has got that great. That great thing. I loved it. At the be- again, the beginning of the book. The remaining parent had died, leaving her two hundred and fifty pounds a year. And Lucy had dried her eyes with one hand and given given in her resignation with the other. It's um. And then, but then she she when she turns to the theatre and to actors who uh, she clearly admires passionately. There's a lovely passage in in To Love and Be Wise mm. uh, where she she's he's, it's Alan Grant looking at uh, Marta Hallard. He looked across at her, elegant and handsome in the firelight, and thought of all the different parts that he had seen her play, courtesans and frustrated hags, careerists and domestic doormats. It was true that actors had a perception, an understanding of human motive that normal people lacked. It had nothing to do with intelligence and very little to do with education. In general knowledge, Marta was as deficient as a not very bright child of 11. Her attention automatically slid off anything that was alien to her own immediate interests, and the result was an almost infantine ignorance. Mm. He'd seen the same thing in hospital nurses and sometimes in overworked GPs, but put a script in her hands, and from a secret and native store of knowledge, she drew the wherewithal to build her characterization of the author's creation. So mm. that's when she admired it. That's good. It's really interesting, isn't it? She it's didn't funny. like publishers and, and books. <laughs> And to the extent that uh, it, it's quite clear that in this, uh, which I think is a first edition, um, that she she wrote her own she wrote her own biography back. The author. <laughs> oh, go on. Josephine Tay began to write very soon after she began to walk, and has been writing off and on ever since. She was destined for university, but because she wanted a life of many facets, she chose instead to spend some years at a physical training college in Birmingham. And thereafter, she rang the changes on hospitals, schools, games pavilions and lecture platforms from one end of England to the other, straightening spines for bread and butter and writing for fun. (laughs) After a first novel, some short stories and poems, she turned to that most demanding of all forms, the play. In 1932, after three Prentice efforts came Richard of Bordeaux, which made theatrical history. This was followed very quickly by The Laughing Woman and Queen of Scots. In 1939, she took to crime using for alias the name of her Suffolk great-great-grandmother, and liked the taste of it so much that once the war was over, she settled down to it in earnest. In Miss Pym Disposes, The Franchise Affair and Brat Farrer, she has found a medium as disciplined as any sonnet, and she Mm. is happy in it. Josephine Tay was born in the Highlands, and now that she is reduced to domesticity, (laughs) she divides her time between the Highlands and London. She has only once used her own life or background in her creative works in Miss Pym Disposes, which is the picture of a physical training college for young women. Now that wasn't written by the publicist. No, that's no, so no, good. no. Yeah. I'd like, I'd like to, we, we've got to wind up in a minute, I, I, but I, bef- um, you know, I, I, as a general reader, I think John feels the same. I was really bowled over by how simultaneously uh, these books don't cleave to a model of crime fiction that I would, as I would understand it, yet are incredibly readable, are page-turningly readable in the true yeah. sense. And you're, you are an expert at writing books of, of, of this kind, that, that every reader will read them who, and want to know what happens next. When you read Josephine Tay, can you see how she does it, or does she still have a kind of mystery and, and magic? I could kind of see how she does it, but it's not how I could do it. 
Yes. Uh, and I admire, uh, I admire her expertise and her skill while at the same time knowing it's a different one from mine, that her concerns are different from mine uh, and her approach is different, but I, it doesn't stop me admiring the skill and the craft she brings to her work. It's, 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 it's masterwork, really. And did you, did you, when you picked up Miss Pym Disposes all those years ago, did it, did it, I mean, is it a book that you referred back to or was it, was it just there in the kind of the, in the, in the, in the background as a, as a sort of an, one of many things? No, it was a, it was a real boom. Uh, right. I thought this is different. This is special. Um, it's not like anything else I've been reading. Uh, and I sought out the rest of her books. Uh, you can, you can see from the sort of fairly tatty state of them that they were wonderful know, pan pan it's, covers I the love pan them. covers and and the green penguins the green, and, yeah yeah uh, mad in the queue uh, <laughs> so they were they were you know almost exclusively picked up in in, in second hand shops over a period of time uh, every time i saw one I, I snatched it because they weren't in print at the time uh, so interesting well the, I've, I've I've got good news for people in a minute. They are in print now. Yes, <laughs> all of them. So, John, we have to we, we have do. to draw matters to a close, at least for for the for the Granite Noir section of this show. We do. Um, so, um, <clears throat> all. Have you got? <laughs> I have. Sorry, I'm just. You got kidding. it. I've got the right. <laughs> <laughs> you got the right bit. I got the right bit. <laughs> okay. Ah, uh, but now, alas, we must wave go- goodbye to the Granite City. Huge thanks to Val for giving us the best excuse ever to plunge into the seductive, often surprising universe of Josephine Tay. To Nikki Birch and the tech team at Granite Noir for transforming this into a watchable and listenable event, and to Unbound for the virtual train fair. Uh, the Granite Noir bookselling partner is Waterstones. So if you visit their their uh, website, you can purchase books by Josephine Tay, Gordon Daviot, Val McDermott, or any of the other Granite Noir writers. Um, just go to waterstones.com or follow links on the festival website. All Granite Noir events will remain online, so you can go back and view any of them at your leisure. They're free to view, but please do consider making a donation to Aberdeen Performing Arts to support the ongoing work of Granite Noir. Click the link on the backlisted website or in any of the Granite Noir pages. Visit the Granite Noir website for more information. Um, you can download all 132 previous episodes of Backlisted. 132. Oh, no. Plus follow links, clips and suggestions for further reading by visiting our website at backlisted.fm. And we're always pleased if you contact us on Twitter or Facebook or now with pictures, Instagram as well. You can also show your love directly by supporting our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash backlisted. We aim to survive without paid for advertising. Your generosity helps us to do that. All patrons get to hear backlisted episodes early. And for much less than the adjusted for inflation price of a rare bit at the teapot, they get two extra lot listed a month. Our very own off bean mental <laughs> gymnasium, where the three of us work out entertaining routines, featuring <laughs> exercises in music, film, TV, and books, and expend almost no physical energy in doing so. Uh, lot listeners also get to hear their names read out on the show as a mark of our thanks and appreciation. And uh, this uh, week's lot listeners are Johnny, you go first. I will. K. Polly, Michael Regan, Emily Alexander, Paul Jarrett, Andrew Stubbs. Lisa Goldman, Joe, Judith Trail, Robert Thomas, Chris Myrna, Ian McDowell, Tonya Haugland Sorensen, Vicky Webb, Hilda Kaiser, Claire Deidre, thanks Claire, thanks. Erin Mayer, thanks Erin, Steve Berrington, thanks all of you. But more to the point, thanks. Queen of Crime, Val McDermott, <laughs> <laughs> for coming on to Battlesea. It's been wonderful to Brilliant. have you. And thank you so much, Granite Noir, for hosting us as well. And we're going to leave you with um, another piece of music. This is from... Um, this is from uh, a 1988 BBC adaptation of The Franchise Affair. 
And just to make the point that the magic of Josephine Tay is you may think you know what she's about or when her books are set, but you probably aren't <laughs> expecting this. See you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. See you. Bye. 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 Now on BBC One, the start of a new drama serial for Sunday evenings. Patrick Malahide and Rosalie Crutchley star in The Franchise Affair. <laughs>